I had a mentor in hope. I had a vision-driven leadership tutorial. I don't know if you have these things. I'm sure you do. I got mine about 10 years ago. It came with my car. And it was called a satellite navigation system. <laughs> you have something like this? I, I can't tell you what a beautiful, even mystical experience this was. You sit in the car, you key in your destination, and a very polite lady says, you want to go there, you go 300 yards straight, and then you turn right. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful, but it immediately struck me that whoever invented this machine had never in his or her life met a Jewish driver. <laughs> Here's this polite lady who says, go 300 yards straight and turn right, and the Jewish driver says, what does she know? I've been living here for 60 years. I know you go 300 yards and then you turn left. And what I found deeply instructive is what this machine does when you completely ignore its instructions after it's only done what you asked it to do. First thing it does, it has savlanut. I can't tell you how Israelis need tutorials from the satellite navigation system. Never loses its cool. It used to pause for a little while and send up a little sign saying, recalculating the route. And then, lo and behold, it shows you the way to get from wherever this ridiculous lost place you, the Shlemiel Jewish driver who got yourself lost in, how to get from there to there. From which I inferred the following, that if you know where you want to be, however lost you are, there is a route from here to there. And if that is not a signal of hope, I don't know what is. And therefore the challenge is this. The real task of vision-driven leadership in the future is to know exactly where we want to be. If we can agree on that, if we can get clear about that, what are we trying to achieve? Then, however lost we are, there's a route from here to there. And believe you me, American Jewry can do. It is the most one of the most remarkable Jewish communities in history. We, from the other side of the Atlantic, we haven't quite got over 1776 yet, but we stand in awed admiration of your achievements. The real task is to know what is the destination. That is the vision-driven leadership, which has characterized Judaism from the very beginning. From the moment that Abraham hears a call to go on this unknown, to this unknown destination, to create a new kind of society, to Moshe Rabbeinu's vision of the burning bush. We have been a people of visionaries. And the real issue is how do we apply that to our current Jewish situation? And I just want to share with you three fundamental principles that we discovered in British Jewry as we were trying to do this 20 years ago and as now, I think, becomes a global Jewish issue. Principle one. I don't know, do you watch TED Talks on, on, on YouTube? There's a wonderful TED Talk, you've probably seen it, by a young man called Simon Sinek, who gave this talk and, and has written a book with the same title, and in it, he asks, what makes certain companies, Facebook, Google, Apple, so incredibly successful and others less so? I mean, Apple and Steve Jobs were not the first people to create an MP3 player. So why was it that the iPod was such a huge success, whereas its predecessors that did the same thing weren't such successes? Why is it that some Leaders are charismatic and change history, and others are not. And what Simon does is he puts up on the board three circles. And on the outermost circle, he writes the word what. In the middle circle, he writes the word how. And in the center, he writes the word why. And he calls his talk and his book, Start With Why. Almost every Jewish continuity proposal ever asks the question, what, and the question, how. But if you want to change the world, don't start with what, and don't start with how. Start with why. And here, 
we have to say something really problematic, challenging. I have to tell you, remember those figures I gave you a little while ago? 74% say being Jewish is remembering the Holocaust, 69% leading a moral life, 56% social justice, 49% intelligent, intelligent, uh, curios, intel, intellectual curiosity, and 42% a sense of humor. Let me tell you something. As wise, those don't quite work. Why? Because, believe it or not, you don't have to be Jewish to remember the Holocaust. In Britain, and I'm sure in the States as well, since the year 2000, January the 27th is National Holocaust Memorial Day. Every, the government pays for every school in Britain, every single school, without exception, to send two kids and a teacher to Auschwitz. You don't have to be Jewish to remember the Holocaust. You don't have to be Jewish to lead a moral life. You don't have to be Jewish to care about social justice. You don't even need to be Jewish to have intellectual curiosity, although in that, in that case it helps. <laughs> you don't have to be Jewish to have a sense of humor. You know, Jackie Mason always used to say at the end of his shows, they laugh at my jokes, and then they go out and they say, too Jewish. The truth is, Jackie Mason, whom I, I know, uh, once invited Elaine and myself to one of his shows, and he gave us the box. It wasn't quite the royal box, Cindy, I'm sorry, but almost. Uh, but we happened to be in the box next to the guy who was doing the lighting. And this non-Jewish lighting engineer practically fell out of the box laughing at Jackie Mason's jokes. So none of these things answer the question, why should I be Jewish? You don't have to be Jewish to be any of those things. And this was our biggest problem in British Jewry. I have to be blunt with you. Our biggest problem was not building more day schools than ever before in British Jewish history. Our difficulty wasn't persuading the British government to pay for them, which was a nice help when it came. Our biggest problem was asking the question, why be Jewish? To be Jewish means to be different. Why should I be different? And you know something? We do not have a history of asking that question. For most of Jewish history, nobody ever asked, why be Jewish? Why be Jewish? Because your parents were Jewish, your grandparents were Jewish, your Bubba and Zeta and their Bubba and Zeta were Jewish. What, diff what choice did you have? That's who you were. But today, when you can choose to be anything you choose to be, today we have to ask, and answer that question. And the real problem with asking and answering that question is that classically there is only one answer. It goes, Asher mikol amim, or mikol amim, you chose us from all other peoples, you loved us, you did. The concept of chosen people. Why be Jewish? Because that's what we were chosen to be. Now, if there is one phrase you cannot use in polite society nowadays, it's chosen people. Have you ever used that phrase in non-Jewish company? You can't use it. It's racist, it's supremacist, it's every ist you can think of. It's politically incorrect, as politically incorrect as it gets. So we had to sit and wrestle, and it took us years how can we get the concept of chosen people into, into people's minds in a way that is not profoundly offensive to our modern sensibilities as liberal Democrats? And in the end, after at least five years of, of intellectual searching, we came up with an answer. It is a phrase. I used it in one of my books, and I later used it as the title of another book, the phrase, The Dignity of Difference. I said, the Bible begins not with Jews, not with Israel, but with humanity. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, Babel and its builders. And it's only with chapter 12 that God tells Abraham to go and start a new way of serving God. And the way I put it was this. Judaism is a protest against empires, against the attempt to impose a single truth on a plural world. 
And as a protest against the first empires, and the first empires were Abraham's Mesopotamia and Moses' Egypt of Ramses II, the first empires in all of human history. Judaism came along and God said to Abraham, go you and be different to teach humanity the dignity of difference. And if you say everyone is different, that's the truth. Everyone is different. But Jews were the only people who throughout history stood firm on the principle of the right to be different, the duty to be different, the dignity of difference. We were the only people who throughout history refused to convert to the dominant religion or assimilate to the dominant culture. But why? To teach humanity the dignity of difference. In technical language, we universalized particularity. It was a paradigm shift, a new way of thinking about Jewish identity that was incredibly inclusive. And because I didn't know whether it would work, I road tested it. Every year, Elaine and I give a reception and we do a study session with the leaders of the National Union of Students. You know there's a lot of anti-Israel activity on British campuses, and we want to have students, that is, non-Jewish students, on our side. So each year, we make a special fast and we cultivate the leadership of the National Union of Students, most, none, almost none of whom are ever Jewish, and we, we sit and we, we we befriend them, we give them a reception, we learn with them. And so for two years in a row, I tested out on them, non-Jews, all of them, the concept of dignity of difference. And I watched the impact of that phrase on that group, some of whom were Muslim, some Hindu, some Sikh, some from the Caribbean, all sorts of colors and ethnicities. And I saw them listening to that session and walking out of the room an inch taller. And you could kind of see what they were saying to themselves. We always knew we were different, but until now, we thought that was a bad thing. And here's the chief rabbi telling us it's a good thing. And believe it or not, the students, the non-Jewish students, took a sentence, that, a sentence out of my book, Dignity of Difference. They wrote it on a plaque. And if you go today to the Students' Union in London University, on the outside wall by the front door, there is a plaque with that quote from the dignity of difference uh, in my name. In other words, we found a way of making being different acceptable in the language of today. We had to do that, or I believe we would never have been able to answer the question, why be Jewish? It's not in itself an answer, but it was a necessary precondition of an answer, and that's what we did. The second thing we did was quite interesting, and it happened almost by accident. You know, as a rabbi, I, for the first three years, ran around all the synagogues in Britain. After three years, I said to Elaine, I've now met all the Jews who come to synagogue. How do I meet the Jews who never come to synagogue? This was an interesting question, and we solved it, actually, in a quite creative way. You wouldn't believe this, but in Britain, where they don't really go in for breakfast television, but they go in for breakfast radio in a very big way. And in Britain, as a curious legacy from the origins of the BBC, there is a pause for religious reflection in the middle of the morning news program. It's called Thought for the Day. And it is the weirdest thing imaginable. You know, you're just getting up, bouncing up, full of the joys of spring, and somebody starts giving you a sermon. It appeals to all my sadistic instincts. <laughs> uh, but I started doing this, and I started doing broadcasting for the BBC. And I found I was reaching, I mean, you know, I mean, the five million key opinion formers in Britain you reach every time you do one of those things. So we started broadcasting. And odd things began to happen. So, for instance, a Jew who never went to synagogue would come in to his office one morning, and the non-Jew who had the office next to him would say to him, Oh, I heard your chief rabbi on the radio this morning. He was quite good. We turned the whole of Britain into an outreach organization <laughs> for the Jewish community. It was weird. In 1991, when I became chief rabbi, the BBC came to me because I'd already done a bit of broadcasting beforehand. And they said to me the most extraordinary thing, I still can hardly believe it happened, but it did for 22 years. They said to me, you know, the, because we have a queen and we have a, 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 an archbishop of Canterbury, they each give a message to the nation. 
So the Queen gives a message to the nation on the 25th of December, the Archbishop of Canterbury, on uh, just after midnight on January the 1st, they said to me, would I like to give a message to the nation just before the Jewish New Year? Now go figure, Jews are less than one half of 1% of the population of Britain, but they're offering a message to the nation. So I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to do it. So we began in 1991 on equal terms, 10 minutes, auto cue, face to camera, incredibly boring, even more than shul. And each year the BBC challenged me to do something a little outside the box and we got more and more interesting. And by about 10 years into this, uh, the Queen was getting eight minutes, the Archbishop of Canterbury five, and I was getting 30. <laughs> and... That's actually what we continue to do all until, uh, you know, until last year. And of course, I wrote a regular column for our, one of our newspapers called The Times, and eight of my books were serialized in the national press because those books were written for non-Jews as well as Jews. The end result was, and it cost us nothing, we were able to take a Jewish voice into the public domain and this was not a voice complaining about anti-Semitism or the isolation of Israel or all the other usual Jewish voices. This was a voice saying, look, there is a Jewish voice and it has a role to play in the national conversation. And it's a voice that speaks to the moral, political, social, intellectual and spiritual challenges of our time. And thanks to the BBC, we got free advertising and it was absolutely incredible. But what we really, really did was to have that point in the wider culture where Jews were able to walk a little taller because we went into the public arena with a Jewish message for the world. And if the world found it relevant, then maybe Jews would. You know, it's always easier to persuade non-Jews. I don't know if you remember, you know, there's one prophet in the Bible who is sent to non-Jews. Anyone remember who that was? Jonah, how many words did Jonah say? Five. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. He says five words. Everyone in Nineveh repents immediately. All the prophets who spoke to Jews spent their whole lives talking. Nobody ever listened. So it's always easier with the non-Jews. But at any rate, when, you, when it works with the non-Jews, it has a feedback effect on Jews. And you begin to build a Jewish message out there in the public domain, and it costs nothing. And finally, three, any Jewish vision of the future has to connect with Israel. I think this is our greatest resource for vision-driven leadership. And the, re the reason is very simple. Because here you come to Israel and you see what identity is really about. Identity is not living a nice life in a suburb and doing religious rituals. Identity here means being part of a landscape, part of a history, part of a global people. And it also speaks to the issues of today that young people are interested in.